Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and future if we can find out about it. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and writer about music for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and various other publications. And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. And as one of the hosts of Talk More Talk, a video podcast about the Beatles as solo artists. How are you doing, Ken? Good, Alan. How are you? Hi, Beatle peoples. Pretty good. Uh, and also, Darren DeVivo, a DJ of long standing, like um, 35 years long standing, at WFUV FM in New York at 90.7. He's been there since 1984. A lot of you probably grew up listening to him. Um, (laughs) And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can still tune in anyway at WFUV.org. How's it going, Darren? Everything is going great. Uh, And I've been at FUV so long, I'm no longer standing and now sitting. (laughs) Bad joke. (laughs) What's Uh, my name? (laughs) Uh, Uh, Hi, everyone. Funny you should mention that. (laughs) Because the topic today will be Ringo's new album, What's My Name? And which we'll get to in a while. But first, we have some news. And I turn you over to Ken. Well, it just so happens that as we record this show on November the 4th, we have late breaking news. You would think that Ringo must be aware that we're doing a show on him because on this day he announced that uh, there'll be another All-Star Band tour. He will be on the road again with the All-Stars for a U.S. tour next year. I should say North American. So far, running from May the 29th, with two dates at the Casino-Rama in Ontario. Then uh, three dates, surprisingly, at uh, the Beacon Theater in New York City, June 2nd, 3rd, and 5th. And the tour continues through June 28th uh, at the Ruth Eckert Hall in Clearwater, Florida, with Edgar Winter opening. As of this moment, there are 20 dates in total, although they may add more. And it will be interesting to see if Ringo will give a concert on what will be his 80th birthday, which is July the 7th. We all remember on his 70th, he gave a concert at Radio City Music Hall, and uh, Paul joined him on stage. Mm -hmm. That was a very special moment right there. Some surprises uh, in this tour are are, uh, these three dates in a row, as I said, at the Beacon, also playing at Tanglewood in uh, Lenox, Massachusetts. That's on June the 19th. I've been told, because I've never seen a concert at Tanglewood, that their sound is amazing. And they're really known for a lot of classical concerts there. Have you ever seen a show there, Alan? Oh, gazillions, yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Oh, you could talk about them then. <laughs> yeah, the sound is quite good. Uh, I mean, you know, the concerts are in a, a, a shell sort of... Um, God... You wouldn't call it a tent. I mean, it's like permanent, but, um, and there's, you know, huge TV screens and speakers for outside because there is lawn seating beyond the main area and, uh, it, it should be good. Mm. A lot of people play yeah. there, you know, Dylan plays there a lot. I wonder if, if we're next, does Dylan perform Tanglewood and Blue when he's there? <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know if uh, Darren's gotten proper sleep at the moment, but uh... <laughs> no, really, really, it's all that standing. Um, <laughs> but there are actually also pretty well-known um, video bootlegs of both the Who and Jethro Tull at Tanglewood from the seventies. James Taylor plays there all the time too. I mean, he's yeah. sort of a local in a way, but but yeah, I mean, I know them mainly for the Boston Symphony playing there because that's their home essentially. It's their summer home. Uh huh. Yeah, I heard about James Taylor. I've always tried to see him at Tanglewood, never got around to seeing it. But now I may definitely make it a point to go for Ringo. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and be at uh, hopefully all three Beacon shows. I'm going to probably go to one of the three, that and Tanglewood. I usually go to an average of two Ringo shows per tour. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm shooting for. Some of the shows have opening acts. The Avid Brothers will open for Ringo and the All-Stars for one date in Maine, one in Massachusetts, and one in New Hampshire. And Edgar Winter will open actually two shows in Florida. There's one in St. Augustine on June 26th, and the one I just mentioned. So far, the last show of the tour in Clearwater, that's on June 28th. No mention of the Greek Theater yet in Los Angeles, where Ringo normally ends his tours, these U.S. tours. The lineup is the same as his most recent tour uh, with Greg Raleigh, Steve Lukather, Hamish Stewart, and Colin Hay, along with Warren Hamm as music director and Greg Bissonette as his second drummer. So just great news just, just to know that Ringo is still at it. He still wants to do this, even after 30 years of touring with the All-Stars. Yeah, and, and, and this looks like it's all, um, it doesn't look like it's all, it is all East Coast. So I would imagine, or sort of East Coast, so I would imagine that, uh, you know, additional, you know, uh, legs of the tour will be added that will take him out West. And maybe that's where, when he ends up in L.A. and the Greek theater. Yeah, uh, I mean, usually whenever Ringo tours, it's for four or five weeks. And that's exactly how long this is. So, in fact, looking at the dates, the further west he's going to get is Pittsburgh. So, there's, I'm sure there's a whole West Coast leg coming at some point. Okay, well, let's hope so for that. More Ringo news. This past Saturday, a special ceremony was held for a peace and love event. For Ringo, it was at Beverly Gardens Park. At Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles, Ringo was on hand to unveil a peace and love sculpture of a hand flashing the peace sign, which he gifted to the city. The sculpture will permanently stay there. Ringo and his wife Barbara attended the ceremony, as did Joe Walsh and his wife Marjorie Buck. Uh, Other news, last week, a one-hour conversation with Ringo was streamed live on Parade.com. Ringo was accompanied by David Lynch and photographer Henry Diltz, and the three of them were interviewed discussing a wide variety of topics. The Beatles, Ringo's new book of photographs, Another Day in the Life, what makes a great photographer, what they like about each other's work, uh, Ringo's new album, What's My Name, Transcendental Meditation, and more. The entire conversation is available now for streaming at Parade.com and also on YouTube under Ringo Star Live, exclusive conversation with David Lynch and Henry Diltz. Hey, somebody pointed out to me, and I'd, I'd be I'd be interested in seeing and hearing from anyone who maybe was there. Um, pointed out to me that afternoon that the event was not selling very well, and sent me the link to like the seating person that I know lives in L.A. I guess maybe they were thinking of going. And other than like the really, really primo seats down on the floor center, the whole theater looked like it was empty. Well, it hadn't been sold unless they were only, you know, filling a portion of, of it up. But I thought that was kind of odd that the day of there were so many tickets available. Mm. Well, I heard about this event, but I didn't even know it was a paying event. Yeah. And I so... couldn't find a lot of information about it. It wasn't on Ringo's website. And I'm wondering if it wasn't really necessarily something that they were expecting to sell out, but just to get enough people in, you know, up in the front rows for, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, for the for, for the for the viewing audience. Mm. Did you guys watch that? No, I did not. I I that night completely forgot it was happening. Ken? I may even have fallen asleep, I think. So I'll catch it now, you know, on at parade dot com. I watched part of it. You know, um, I wasn't able to watch the whole thing, but as long as it's online, I can always go back and watch it. Sure. So did you? Did you? Yeah, I did. You know, it touched on most of the topics you mentioned. I mean, transcendental meditation, basically the only thing that was said about that is that David Lynch's um, foundation um, underwrites teaching transcendental med- meditation in schools. That was basically the total 
of what was said about that. Um, there were some interesting things. I mean, the fact that David Lynch went to the um, first Beatles concert in the U.S. in Washington, D.C., that was kind of interesting. And, you know, and they did talk about, you know, photography, which kind of makes sense if you're going to have Henry Diltz there, you know, uh, and right. they were promoting Ringo's book. So a lot of it was about that. A, a little bit of it was about the new album. You, you know, it was it was the kind of pleasant conversation. After a while, David Lynch and Henry Diltz just sort of, you know, faded out of the proceedings and it was just Ringo talking you know um, mm-hmm. in fact my wife came in and said you know what why aren't those guys saying anything and so I went back to the beginning <laughs> and showed her you know well here in the beginning they were talking <laughs> but now they're now they're just listening to Ringo and yeah Ring, <laughs> Ringo was kind of prodding Henry to say something yeah yeah and he said I, I'm just having fun you know <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it was it was it was okay, not the most illuminating Ringo conversation, but um I think the most illuminating Ringo conversation recently is one that was broadcast um I think it was a Dutch radio interview in which Ringo actually talked a, a good deal about the new album and actually answered one of my questions that that uh we had discussed earlier. Um, so maybe we'll wait until when we get to that. All right. Uh, more Ringo news, as if that wasn't enough. A new interview with two drummers, Ringo and Dave Grohl, appears in the latest Rolling Stone, where they talk about the Beatles drumming, Ringo saying that he really loved Nirvana, Ringo's new album and book, and Paul's bass playing. Grohl saying how much he loved Paul's bass line in Hey Bulldog. He pinpointed that particular song. YouDiscoverMusic.com has a report on Paul McCartney's two new songs coming out. The titles for the songs are Home Tonight and In a Hurry. And on November 22nd, they'll be released digitally. And after that, followed by a very limited record store day picture disc, 7-inch vinyl. You were talking about that last time, Darren, asking yeah. if it would be on a picture disc. Mm-hmm. And uh, it has uh, exclusively created artwork based on the parlor game Exquisite Corpse along with a lyric insert. And both songs were recorded during the Greg Kirsten sessions for the album Egypt Station. So um, the digital release comes out November 22nd. A week later, the picture just comes out. Yes. Okay. So November 22nd, we have that, the digital release. Um, We also have the Beatles singles collection. And we also have um, the Harry Nilsson album called Lost and Found which right. is a, whole, a batch of uh, Harry's last songs that he wrote. It also happens to have a cover version, by the way, of Yoko's Listen, the Snow is Falling on there. And uh, Mark Hudson has produced the album. I know that Jim Keltner plays on it. Kifo Nilsson, one of um, Harry's sons, plays bass on there. And Jimmy Webb, as well, uh, helps out musically on the album. So all three of those releases uh, comes out November 22nd. That's day. Uh, just a few more things. Peter Asher's new book is officially out. It's called The Beatles from A to Z. Peter, of course, is one half of the duo of Peter and Gordon in the 60s and went on to become one of the most successful record producers working with the likes of Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor. And um, his new book has him sharing his memories and insights of the Beatles and their music. He discusses everything from their songs to the instruments they played, the Beatles' musical innovations, and the artists they influenced. And the book actually grew out of the popularity for his radio show called From Me to You on the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. So that book is officially out now. I believe yeah. Beatlefest is selling autographed copies of it. If you order from yes. directly from Beatlefest... Okay. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to have an autographed copy. Peter signing it. Also, former member of Badfinger, Joey Molland, has been working on a new album, and he's in good company with many Beatle people. Mark Hudson is also behind this one, producing it, and Julian Lennon will be contributing as well to the album. And former drummer from Wings, Steve Holly, plays on it. And a good friend of ours, the great artist and painter and illustrator, Shannon, who's done a lot of great work on the Beatles and plays 
a variety of instruments, uh, guitar in particular. She's playing on the new Joey Molland album. They're hoping that it will be out in early 2020. And speaking of Julian Lennon, he's recorded a duet with former Styx frontman Dennis DeYoung. Hmm. And this is going to be on Dennis's next solo album, what he's calling his final album. Uh, the song is called Good Old Days. All right. And one last thing. There's a new film called Marriage Story, starring Scarlett Johansson, Laura Dern, and Alan Alda. And it will have a limited theatrical release of November 6th to be available for streaming on Netflix in December. The trailer for the film actually plays Paul McCartney's studio recording of Maybe I'm Amazed. So I don't know if there'll be any kind of soundtrack and if the song will be on there, but they are using Paul's song for that. Okay, that's all the news I got. That's it? That's I'm, it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm glad uh, I, I listened to this podcast, Things We Said Today, because I'm learning everything. As Ken's going off, I'm going, oh, I missed that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't oh, know much of that I either. <laughs> you know. So. You know, so much of this I pick up on Facebook. Hmm. Well. I only learn about some of these things through Facebook. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a lot of my news from specific Facebook pages and posts that I get on my Facebook page. So if anybody listening has some news they want to send to me that we could use to the show, by all means, send it to Ken Michaels or the Things We Said Today page. Absolutely. Okay. Hmm. Help us do our show. <laughs> Okay, so um, the main topic is, of course, Ringo's What's My Name? And um, let's see. I, I didn't get the vinyl. Did you get the vinyl, Darren? Is I have vinyl? the colored vinyl, the black vinyl, and CD. But I am um, actually mm -hmm. been just listening to the CD. Okay, yeah, uh -huh. I just have the CD and, uh, you know, just to describe it, I mean, it's got, you know, a lot of people probably seen pictures of the cover just has a star with Ringo standing in front of it and what's my name title with my in red and he is wearing a John Lennon button on his um, I don't know if that counts as a lapel but it's uh, you know on on his jacket and he is holding the ever-present peace symbol you open it up and you see Ringo in a totally different outfit also holding the peace symbol and with a uh, planet or moon or something um, behind him. Gives the lineups for, you know, who plays what on each track uh, in the fold out, but no lyrics, nothing like that. And then uh, flip it over, the back has credits for, you know, production credits, and then there's another panel with just the star that he's standing in front of on the front cover this has been getting a lot of interesting reactions because um you know people who are normally kind of bored with ringo solo albums have been posting that you know first were posting when it was announced that they had no interest whatsoever and are now posting that they've been listening to it and they love it so <laughs> you know something about it that um that must be appealing to you know people who are not necessarily well disposed towards everything Ringo does. And uh, in my opinion, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel that the sort of rockiness of most of the tracks is, you know, maybe what appeals because it's a very tight band. You look at the personnel. I mean, you got Nathan East on bass most of the time. I mean, there is that one track that has Paul McCartney on bass. And uh, and a couple of others, other bass players appear to uh, Warren Ham is in it. Richard Page, a lot of people we know from the tours. Dave Stewart is on some some songs, and uh, Edgar Winter. A uh, number of people from from the All Star Band. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe also the fact that you know he's he's doing more with his All Star guys now is you know, and these are people he plays with four stretches of, you know, five weeks at a time, you know, maybe that helps too, but it, it seems to me to be a really tight record, tight, mm -hmm. rocky, energetic. So let's start with Ken. What do you think? I agree with some of the things you said there. I, I'm really enjoying the album now. It's taken me 
several listens to really appreciate it. There were a few songs that instantly leaped at me, as most albums do. Um, and I think what I like about the album is, like you said, the tightness of it. And for the most part, it's mid-tempo to up-tempo songs, with the exception of A Girl With Me. And I think that's part of the appeal of this album. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's a solid album throughout. I love the production behind it. I think Ringo's drumming being up front makes it more special. And it's been that way on his most recent albums, the ones that he's mixed and produced with, with Bruce Sugar. And um, I appreciate that more and more on his albums because I want to hear Ringo's drumming and I want to hear his fills. And he plays exactly what's needed in these songs. And the musicianship is top notch. You mentioned all the all the great musicians that are on there. And uh, they really add a lot to the songs. The only problem that I have, and this is I would apply this to every artist when it comes to production. I'm, I'm not a big fan of vocals being pushed back. Hmm. lead vocals in particular most of this album Ringo's vocals are not up front enough for me mm -hmm. and I do feel that Ringo's vocals no he's not he's not John or Paul vocally he's not a Roger Daltrey he's not a Robert Plant and he's even admitted he's not Pavarotti <laughs> <laughs> but um, he has a very endearing warm voice and it's you could call it a character voice and it works on his songs. I've grown to love his voice all these years, and I'd rather have his voice more up front. Actually, in Grow Old With Me, it is. But on most of the songs, it's not. It's kind of buried. You, you kind of feel like he's a foot or more away from the microphone. But I still like everything else in the mix. I love all the musicianship. Whatever is played is what really, really makes each song gel. You know, for example, uh, the first song, Gotta Get Up to Get Down, I love a lot. Ringo wrote that with Joe Walsh, and you can hear Joe uh, harmonizing with Ringo on it, and, and Joe, in fact, even shares lead vocals and does some rapping in the song. Mm -hmm. I don't know if their voices blend together all that well, and I'd rather have Ringo's vocals more up front uh, when he's singing alone. But the songs are really what's carrying this album. They're all good songs. And, you know, how do I say this? I want to be very... Um, diplomatic. Yes, well, there you go. I want to be diplomatic about this. Um, on the one hand, I, I praise Ringo because his songs are almost all about peace and love. And they're all very positive. And Lord knows we need people in this world to give us positive messages. And that's what it is throughout this entire album, really. And I praise him for that. I'm very proud of him for that. And he himself is proud of who he is and where he stands in that position. And I think part of the strength of this album is that he exudes confidence and I feel it in him. I feel it in the music. I feel it in his interviews. He knows this is who he is. He wants to talk about peace and love. He wants to talk about positive messages. And um, th these positive messages are all inspiring. And we need more music like that. But sometimes I wish there'd be a little bit more variety when it comes to the lyrics of his songs mm -hmm. and that he would write about something else. But for me, the excitement in following Ringo's career, especially post Mark Hudson, is in all the different songwriting collaborations that he's involved with. And, um, you know, that's the exciting part for me, seeing him grow as a songwriter. And yes, he repeats some of the same people on his albums. He, he's had a, a country songwriter named Gary Nicholson who I believe has written one song with Ringo on each album, going back several albums now. He continues to write with Gary Burr from the Roundheads. Mm -hmm. He continues to write with Joe Walsh. He writes with Dave Stewart. For me, the biggest highlight in, in this album comes from this guy named Sam Hollander, mm -hmm. who is a songwriter and producer, and he's probably best known for working with Panic! at the Disco. He wrote a song on this album called Better Days, which is one of the killer tracks on this album. And it's a really tight song. It's under three minutes. It's really catchy. It doesn't sound like any other song that Ringo's done. It's very commercial, and it really works for Ringo. 
And whenever Ringo works with anyone new for the first time, I find that exciting. And Ringo, in fact, co-wrote a song called Thank God for Music with Sam Hollander. And that's a very strong track, too. But, um, you know, there's so many great things I could say about about this album, mainly that the songs are strong, which is the most important thing. Uh, the first two songs that we were exposed to, uh, the title track, which I think is a killer rocker. Again, Ringo's vocals are pushed way too too back for the song for What's My Name and Grow Old With Me, which I think really works. I love that arrangement more and more the more I hear it. Those are definite highlights. But um, Better Days is, is such a great song. Uh, between that and another song on the album called Magic, which Ringo wrote with Steve Lukather. He's been writing with him, too. Mm -hmm. That's a great song. And that doesn't sound like any other song that Ringo has released before. You feel the positive vibes. You feel the energy. It's well well produced. I'll say it for the last time, except for the vocals being pushed back. But I love all the musicianship. It all works on that level. The songs are really powerful. And um, it's a very tight album. Kicks in at, I think, 35 minutes. It's very short, you know. But for those 35 minutes, it's really enjoyable. But what you know what surprises me is all these people who are suddenly loving this album. And to me, as much as I love What's My Name, it's not like I would say, gee, this is so much better than all the other albums post Mark Hudson. They all have very strong songs and very strong collaborations in terms of songwriting. So, But I think the only main difference is that almost every song is up-tempo to, uh, you know, faster. They're good rock songs. And, um, you know, it's just, it goes right by very quickly, these 10 songs. And they're all so enjoyable. Maybe it's more consistently strong. I don't know. But so many of the other albums post Mark Hudson, I really feel are, are kind of close in quality to this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, Darren. It's, it's funny. Uh, I'm, I'm serious when I say this, Ken. Almost every single point you brought out was a point that I was going to make mention. I think our opinions of the album are virtually identical. Uh, I was, um, I knew I would like the album, but the first couple of listens, nothing really grabbed me mm -hmm. at first. Kind of had this overall feeling that it's a good record. But, you know, further listens allowed me then to you know, kind of like, you know, you know, peel away a few layers of the onion and hear some other things. Uh, some of the songs, the ones that I were, would become my favorite started to come front and center. The ones that I thought were maybe a little of the lesser tunes, you know, kind of drop back a bit. Everything you mentioned about the album sounding good is dead on. The mm. band, the, all the musicians, I know it's not really a, a set band or variations, but everybody plays together very well and very tightly, and it's a very well-produced album. So a big thumbs up to Ringo, who only recently in the post-Mark Hudson, and please somebody correct me if I'm wrong, only recently post-Mark Hudson has Ringo really grabbed the producing reins uh, himself uh, and really grabbed hold of what his albums are going to sound like. And it feels like there were some instances on records like for example why not that may have had some missteps in the mix or something i don't hear a lot of that now it seems like he's coming to his own now as a producer mm. and i i hear what you're saying about the vocals being buried a bit that doesn't bother me as much as it bothers you i think that's that's actually in my i feel like the nature of the beast with a lot of recordings that are done today that tend to be loud sounding albums and there seems to be a little bit of everything up in your face and the vocals just take i think uh, a little bit of a hit because of that but uh my favorite tracks uh, are, are i will say this i'm not crazy about thank god for music and i think what you point out about you know the message being typical ringo and we all need the positivity and I have no issues with the message. It just seems like there's so much of the message. <laughs> Peace and love. And I think for this album, that's the result of there being 
four consecutive tracks in the second half of the album, Better Days, Life is Good, Thank God for Music, Send Love, Spread Peace. Mm-hmm. That maybe could have broke that up a bit. I think Grow Old With Me might have worked closer to the middle of the album uh, as, a, as like an interlude midway through it. And maybe something as simple as Magic maybe dropped back a little bit to try to spread the life is good, better days, send love stuff around a little better in the album might have made a minor improvement, not made it sound like you're listening to the same message, you know, Mm -hmm. um, song after song, if that makes sense. I think Magic and Better Days are the two best songs on the album. What's funny about Magic, the minute I heard that song, it sounded like something Toto circa the 1980s. <laughs> and then I checked, and because, you know, the times actually when I really got to listen closely to the album, I didn't have any of the notes with me. So I had to make a mental note, and any time I have to use my brain is not good, but I went back, checked the notes, and I'm like, yeah, wouldn't you know it? Steve Lukather had a hand at writing it. I could hear him playing on the track. It really sounds like a Boz Skag Silk Degrees outtake magic. It's and, funny. And the guys from Toto played on Silk Degrees, so... Yeah. Um, uh, and it makes sense that... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's funny you mention that because I was just having lunch recently with one of our listeners, Steve Sanderson, from Massachusetts, and he brought up the song Breakdown Dead Ahead from Boz Skaggs and how magic reminded him of that song. Yeah, that's very good, yeah. Yeah. I've had actually instances listening to this album, and I think it might be one of the things that it, appe- it is making folks like this album, is that there are moments that are reminiscent of something you've heard in the past, not necessarily Beatlesque. Yeah, there are a lot uh, of them. A lot of the chord progressions are, you yeah. know, you're thinking, okay, what, I mean, what is that the chord progression to? Yeah, you know, it's... right. Like I, like I said, Magic, the first time... Oh, wow, that could be on the, you know, that could be a Toto track from the 80s. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that sounds like something maybe off Boskeg, Silk Degrees. And then, of course, there's a song called Better Days. But later in the album, and I should have uh, I should have wrote the title down. It could very well be it's either Life is Good, Thank God for Music or Send Love, Spread Peace. It's the Kinks Better Days. <laughs> uh, OK, and, you know, the beginning of the song. And sometimes I find that that quality about an album or a song sometimes is appealing because it's familiar and it makes you smile and it's something that, oh, yeah, listen, I, I recognize that. That sort of sounds like, you hear that? That sort of sounds like, you know, the Kinks' better days. Mm-hmm. I think little little touches like that, even though they may be accidental, I'm sure they are, it can be endearing. And I think it's one of the, one of the draws, subtle, little nuances about this album that our people are uh, picking up on and uh, are relating to you know the, um, weir- the weirdest one for me is you know he's got his his remake of money mm-hmm. and then after it immediately after it is better days and the intro riff to better days sounds more to me like the actual intro to money than his new intro to money yeah yeah sometimes i've all, i've often found that you know, those little qualities, like I say, can be endearing. Uh, as long as it doesn't sound like it, song after song, it's like, all right, which one is this sounding like now? <laughs> That's not what and isn't, the album doesn't flow like that. It's just got these little comfortable uh, moments that, you know, and with money, I know some people weren't nuts about it. And I fully expected to dislike it, uh, but it's not bad. In fact, a minute it started, I thought. I wonder if Ringo had in the back of his mind the Flying Lizards version (laughs) of Money. You know the one I mean? Yeah. It sort of has that new wave-ish 80s sort of thing. Ringo is clearly trying to do something a little, you know, with the the song, you know, with the heavy auto-tuning on purpose and some vocal effects. He's clearly just trying to stir the pot a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm by pulling this old rock and roll chestnut out and and just kind of doing something a little different with it that is like, a, a, you know, just a little extra, a, a little seasoning to the album. 
But I hear, I'd love to know if Ringo was even familiar with the flying, is it's the flying lizards? I, yeah, that did yeah. that, that had that, the best things in life are free version of money. <laughs> you know, the strange thing is the intro to money, because it's a sort of weird uh, synthesizer y kind of thing instead of, you know, the traditional one. For some reason, it sounded to me as if it was being sort of purposefully zany. And in that sense, it reminded me of the coasters. I hear what you're saying about that new wave sound. It definitely has some of that. But um, but the way I first heard it was as almost, a, you know, technologically updated coasters version, sort mm-hmm. of taking taking something from the Beatles past. I mean, they used to do a lot of coaster stuff. And they right. used to do money and sort of making a, a, a almost a kind of stylistic mashup between the song and the and another group's sort of approach. Mm-hmm. Of course, the coaches didn't um, do much with synthesizers, but still, you know. What I mean? Right. Yeah. Something else also you pointed out, Ken, which I agree with. I really don't think this album is heads and shoulders better than some of the recent things he's done. In fact. It fits in very nicely with Postcards from Paradise and Give More Love, two albums that I feel almost exactly, I, I, I kind of feel the same about those two albums as I do this one. Uh, uh, I, that, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah, totally. Except that maybe, like, like we've been pointing out, the fact that this one tends to stay, you know, upbeat and other than Grow Old With Me, it stays uh, upbeat tempo-wise. It doesn't stop. It keeps coming at you. Toe tappers, you know, a catchy riff here and there uh, that maybe the other albums don't have or, you know, that's sort of broken up a bit. You know, he delivers, again, an album that you expect from him. And I mean that in a good way. Consistent. He really is on a consistent streak of quality work. He's not going to, you know come up with a 25 minute progressive rock piece he's not gonna you know suddenly start writing like bob dylan you know he's uh, not going to do uh anything out of the ordinary he's gonna be he's 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 almost like a you know an acdc type you want acdc to do what they've done for decades now you know and if they vary it's going to be a disappointment and that's what Ringo's all about. And he delivers album after album, some maybe a little better than others. Uh, but he he just put out another winner here. I only wish that more people were aware of and, uh, you know, of would be interesting to see what the sales are like uh, or more people are more open, you know, yeah, to but, what Ringo's yeah. doing. But I could say that about a lot of veteran acts. Yeah. Sure, but, but he does he does vary what he does. I mean, the Give More Love had a, a you know more in the way of acoustic tracks with a sort of country feel, and uh, and that's something he does really well yeah. too. None of that here. So there, you know, there are a number of things that he can do well, and he does them, you know, in different places on different albums, depending what the mood of the whole thing is. And this is a you know, sort of a, a good time rock album with yeah. all of these sort of affirmative messages, which I, I, I guess, you know, in a way can get to be too much when you have too many of them in a row. But that's, you know, that's Ringo's message, you know? I mean, that's yeah. that's his thing. He's not, as you say, Dylan or John Lennon, you know? Uh, he's, I think his um, psyche as a performer is really from an earlier time where you're just out there to give people a good time and i mean that's what he said when he started the all-star band you know in 89 he said you know i'm I'm not out to break anyone's brains <laughs> that's mm-hmm. the interesting way he put it and uh you know, he just wants people to have a good time and then he added you know more of the peace and love thing and uh, in a way you know, people get a little impatient with that, but we, we didn't get that impatient with it when John was doing it all the time. And it, it is, it's not a message that is objectionable in any way. So I'm not sure, right. you know, what the issue is there. But uh, Grow Old With Me, that's the, that's the one I wanted to mention about that Dutch interview. 
because, mm. you know, when Ringo's been talking about this, it's been as if, you know, this is a totally unknown song that Jack Douglas just played him and uh, and he decided to do it, you know, giving this song, uh, you know, a public. But, of course, it had a public because it was on Milk and Honey and uh, it, and there's also been an orchestrated version that Yoko put out. And uh, in this Dutch interview, Ringo is telling the Jack Douglas story about, you know, the demo tape and Jack Douglas saying, uh, you know, that John has this message on there saying, this is for you, Ringo, and and all that. And the Dutch interviewer is the first person interviewing him who actually ask the question, you know, or, or actually Ringo said, you know, I, I never heard it before, did you? And the the interviewer said, yeah, it came out in the 80s. And Ringo, Ringo picked up very quickly. He said, well, I missed most of the 80s. <laughs> but, <laughs> but of course, it, you know, it's, I don't know, it just seems so strange to me that, you know, that means that, you know, there's been a lot of time since he got sober again, which was just 89, 88. There's mm -hmm. been plenty of time for him to catch up with um, things that have been released by his former partners. So I was a little surprised that it was still sort of totally new to him. But you know what? Maybe in a way that's good. You know, may he's coming to this song a lot fresher than any of us would have. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yeah. But it is shocking. I mean, to me, I would expect any of the four Beatles to be aware of each other's solo work, all mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> and uh, especially considering Milk and Honey was, was the album that came out after John's death. People were waiting for it for such a long time. It finally came out. You would have thought the other Beatles would certainly be very interested in hearing those songs, you know, if they didn't have access to them already. So it's, it's a, very surprising to me yeah plus like you said the version that george martin did the the orchestration that version came out as well and there have been other people who have covered it yeah like like uh mary chapin carpenter had a hit with it mm -hmm. not that i expect him to know the the mary chapin carper catalog but it was a hit you know on the adult contemporary charts and you'd think he'd be somewhat aware yeah, you know, I mean, it being a hit on a chart doesn't necessarily mean he would have known that John wrote that one, even if he knew the song, which apparently he didn't anyway. But, uh, you know, it's it's very possible that, you know, when Milk and Honey came out, uh, this was still all a little bit raw for Ringo, and he didn't jump on it the way, you know, a fan would have. You know, maybe right. was, maybe he thought it was sort of painful, and he just sort of put it on the shelf and never got back to it. Uh, it's just a guess, you know. That's a good point because we do know that John intended to work with Ringo on what became Stop and Smell the Roses, his album. Mm -hmm. And there were dates already booked in January of 81 for that. So the fact that Ringo didn't record any of the songs that John intended for Ringo. And at this point, it's still, to me, it's not clear which songs they were because I've heard that nobody told me that he might have considered that for Ringo life begins at and, 40 and, and that too. Yeah. yeah. So it was well, probably if he makes another painful. country album. He can do that one, <laughs> <laughs> but it was evidently so painful f for Ringo to even think about doing that for the album that he didn't even attempt to. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. But anyway, I wanted to just bounce off something that both of you said, and that's that Ringo has a style that's all his own. And you don't expect him to put out a groundbreaking album. And at the same time, he puts out very enjoyable songs. The thing that's really remarkable about Ringo to me is that so much of his songs in terms of the chords, the progressions are very simple. And yet they work for him. Mm hmm. And that's all that really matters is whether or not the songs work. You know, I remember Paul McCartney talking about 50s rock and roll and Chuck Berry and how so much of it is just three chords. Yeah. And Paul would say, you know, it's not that easy to write a great song with just a few chords. And uh, Ringo was able to do that consistently, although throughout, uh, you know, uh, ever since certainly the Vertical Man album. He's co-written almost every song on his solo albums. 
I know that he co-wrote with George and also Vinnie Poncia in the 70s and some with Joe Walsh. But the majority of Ringo's songs in his solo career that he wrote is a co-write. And yet they all sound like songs that Ringo had a lot of involvement with. They sound like Ringo melodies and they work for him and they stick out in your brain. They are catchy songs. Mm -hmm. And um, this is just a, a very consistently strong album for me personally. The songs that I want to hear more of from Ringo are songs that are a little bit different in terms of the musical styles. In particular, I love when he worked with Van Dyke Parks mm -hmm. and he would do a song like Samba or Bambula. Those are very different songs. Bambula is very Cajun like uh, a song like Time that he wrote with Dave Stewart, which has a very spacey, I don't even know if you call it jazz feel. Those are a little bit experimental for Ringo. I like when he does something that's out of the ordinary. This is more typical Ringo, what's on the new album, for the most part. You know, with the exception of uh, a song like Magic, which it's funny how you said that, Darren. It does sound like it could be a Boz Skaggs, you know, Toto era uh, right, arrangement, right. you know, and, um, and Better Days as well. And it's at, after the first few times listening to this album, I said, Better Days and Magic are, you know, the two standouts for me. It's funny you said the same thing, Darren. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty because they, they, they just do jump out at you. For, at least they did for me. And um, like I said, I mean, the only thing that I could, that, that sort of was a fault of mine could be that he's got, you know, similar sentiments uh, front and center over the second half of the album. You know, if it just would have maybe scattered them around a bit. Save Grow Old With Me later on is something that the album builds up to. Maybe it's the next to last song, you know, and then and then you get hit with, like, the, the modern day I'm the greatest. What's my name at the right. end of the album? <laughs> right. So, you know. I'll be curious to see, because these, we've said this before, a lot of songs on here, you could see them working well live, but yet Ringo rarely will play his new stuff live. He's got this, he's he's stuck on performing Anthem from 2012? Ringo 2012. 2012, yeah. So he really likes Anthem, which is okay, that's fine, but it seems like he, has, he just doesn't, you know, uh, acknowledge his current stuff on the tour that he's on. Right. I'd like to see him do Gotta Get Up to Get Down, What's My Name, you know, those two, to just to name two, uh, you know, in his show. They would work live. We're on, like, we're on the road again. We all thought, yep. oh, that's a no-brainer, and he never did it. Mm -hmm. Or at least he didn't, you know, do it consistently. He did it once or twice, but it was not something that became that live staple that you figured it would be. No, he never I, did that song live. No, he never did. I mean, I'd like to see him do What's My Name or Gotta Get Up to Get Down. Gotta Get Up to Get Down could open up, you know, the 2020 tour. Yeah, um, he should do more. I mean, because the thing is that on one hand, you, you understand his reasoning that, first of all, he's going doing the round robin thing with everybody playing their songs. And so he's not doing a whole set, really, uh, of his songs, even though I think he has most of them, the, the the largest number obviously of songs and he knows that people want to hear the old Ringo hits and a couple of the things he sang with the Beatles but on the other hand it kind of gives the impression almost as if he doesn't believe in the new stuff in which case you know why is he putting it out you know I, I, I would love to see him do a show where he plays the whole album or most of the album you know, just as a way of, and, and I wonder if he, um, if he did that, because I think a lot of the people who go to see Ringo and the All-Star show, you know, don't keep up with his new stuff. You know, they're going for the oldies show, but maybe if he played this stuff and said what it was and it's on his new album and all that, the way a young touring group would do, uh, maybe people would pick up on them, you know? Well, We've argued this point many times yes, over. Yes, it's true. Yeah, it shows. And um, Ringo doesn't want his concerts to be history lessons on his career. 
And it really is a shame because there's so many great songs throughout his entire solo career that we'd love to see him do. I, every time that I hear the song Snookaroo, I think to myself, <laughs> this would be a great live song. Seriously, yeah. whatever you oh, think yeah. of the song, it, it, it would kick ass live. And he's never done that live. And um, there's so many really strong songs on all of his solo albums. The only time I think he would have been pleased, um, Alan, are the few shows that he did with Mark Hudson and the Roundheads, yeah. where he played several songs from the new album, but also played his staples at the same time. Right. So you listen to Storytellers, for example, an right. album like that. Yeah, so, I mean, those shows were, were really sort of specifically focused events, either for a TV special to produce, to promote whatever was new, or in a little place like The Bottom Line. Um, right. You know, I, but I, I wish he would tour that way. I mean, I kind of thought that when I saw the Roundheads at the bottom line, I thought, this is this is great. This is a lot of fun. I'd like to see him with a band that he plays with regularly and records with. Doing- I think he genuinely feels that his fans don't want him to play the new stuff. They want him to stick to his Beatles songs and the hits that he had in the 70s. And I know uh, I didn't get to see the bottom line show uh regretfully my wife went to that show and um ringo was amazed at how the audience loved it Mm -hmm. and there was all this new music that he played Mm -hmm. i think he really was astounded that the public there it's a small club mind you but they all were digging it and some of them knew the songs in advance (laughs) the new songs so i think he was really shocked at that i think he just prefers to go the safe route playing in a band with established stars yeah. and um you know sharing the spotlight with them right. and if he gets one new song from the new album when give more love came out for a very brief time he played that song give more love and then he dropped it he only did that in a few shows well now he and has it n- now he has <laughs> a, a built-in possibility to change up one of his you know sort of the major sticks in his show he can yeah. say What's the name of my new album? (laughs) (laughs) Not only that, but I mean, the song, not only it's a great rock song, What's My Name, but it tells you his whole life story in it. It's so about him, even though Colin Hay wrote it. Mm -hmm. Because he's saying, everything's the same and I'm still in the game. That's what it's all about. He's Mm -hmm. still out there rocking and rolling on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so perfect. It's tailor-made for him to do that. But, like I was saying so many times when Give More Love came out, we're on the road again. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> They're on the road. And Steve Lukather, who co-wrote the song with Ringo, is in the band. Why aren't they doing We're on the Road again? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any sense. No. But, you know. It, it's the same type of argument that we will have, the debate, rather, that we would we have with McCartney over him varying from the script and throwing in more curveballs than he does or you know i wish he would stop doing hey jude here or you know they feel i guess when all is said and done i think we're the type of fan that makes up the smaller percentage of the people going to see the shows you know that the majority of the people going to see the shows are the ones who want to hear the hits so give the people what they want yeah, I mean, um, I understand that, but it's a kind of arrested development. I mean, how did all the songs that they want to hear become songs that they want to hear? Mm-hmm. By the Beatles and early Ringo and or early Paul going out and playing them and putting them out and, you know, and making a, a big deal about them. You and know? radio, radio made those songs hits. Right. You know, it's... it's and that's a problem now. W- w- without... No- yeah. I, I say this. There's no radio for, you know, I mean, just look over the past few months. Ringo Starr's got an album out. Are you anyone aware that Robbie Robertson has a new album out? Mm-hmm. Van Morrison? Mm-hmm. Bruce Hornsby? No. I bet you, <laughs> no. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. now where we're at. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's unfortunate, but it's where we're at now. If it gets any airplay, it's so minimal. And it was the same thing with Paul, with Egypt Station. I mean, I've said it many times. The reason why Egypt Station debuted at number one was because Paul worked his butt off promoting it. And he created all these events, or his team did, 
and his name was everywhere. And, you know, the Carpool Karaoke right. was really such a big part of why that album did as well as it did. It certainly had nothing to do with radio because radio barely touched him. Right. So um, happy to say FUV played it when it first came out. Right. But for a very short time. Yeah. And that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, the reason why an album like that doesn't stay on the charts is because radio doesn't play it. So if the artist isn't doing the songs on stage, what chance does it have at all to sell? Right. Really? Unless fans spread the word about it through social media. In some ways, as as much as I love doing the podcast shows that I do, we have enormous power when we have a Facebook page and we share a song that we believe in. You know, we could post a new song from Ringo, a new song from Paul, anything Beatles, anything we want. And we could have a few hundred people listening to these songs just because we post them. So in some ways, that's kind of taking the place of what radio used to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. You know, one more thing. I I just wanted to say one thing. You were talking before about songs that remind you of other songs. And that's going to happen a lot with any artist, especially one that's been around for so long. You're going to hear a melody that will remind you of some other melody that that artist has done or maybe another artist or a chord progression that you know you hear it and you say where did i hear that before but when i hear send love spread peace it reminds me a lot of peace dream going back a few albums from ringo if you listen to the melody of that and it's the same theme (laughs) Mm -hmm. and and peace dream he mentioned sean lennon a lot and uh, the bed ends and you know, so listen to those two songs back to back. They're very similar to me, anyway. Interesting. Okay. Uh, there was another. There's another track on the album now, and again, I should have wrote this down. That sort of reminds me a little bit of Dave Clark Five's "Glad All Over." <laughs> um, but yeah, I have to maybe I don't know. I don't recall. It was another little bit. It may have been just a little bit of the way the the beat, the rhythm of the song, maybe more so uh, than uh, anything else. But, you know, you could sum it up very briefly. R- Ringo puts out another strong Ringo record, uh, not going to disappoint. Um, some people, you know, are really uh, surprising me, as Alan pointed out, with their reaction being so overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and I'm like, good, it's about time. You should have felt this way about a, a half dozen albums over the past 20 years, in my opinion, but terrific, you know, and uh, more power to Ringo. And, and you know, it, uh, who knows? We may be talking a year from now about the follow up to What's My Name. Mm-hmm. Well, Ringo still loves doing this, you know, whether it's making new albums or touring. And I'm just so grateful that he's still out there. And um, and this is what's important to him. You got to right. love what you're doing. Yep. Right. And, and thank God he's so healthy. <laughs> okay. So I think, uh, at least for the moment, we've um, seen to the ins and outs of Ringo's What's My Name. Um, possibly in, at some future point, we'll revisit it, see how it sits with us after a couple of years, as we've done with other Beatles and solo albums. And uh, so... Thanks, guys, for your opinion. And why don't we give our contact information? Uh, I'll start. Uh, you can get to me through at Facebook, probably the most, the easiest way, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can contact all of us at our email address, Things We Said Today Radio Show at Gmail dot com. Are we going to change that, Darren, eventually? Is it, we uh, it's very possible, but for now, let's stay where we were at. For okay, the Darren, Darren is on a secret mission to revamp our web presence with perhaps names that are less Germanically lengthy than we have now. Like, for instance, our Twitter feed is at Things We Said Fab, and our Facebook page of which we also have two. There is a Things We Said Today page, um, but the one we mainly use is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans on Facebook. So um, one day we will rationalize all these, but for the moment, that's where we are. So, Darren? 
Yes. You're contacting oh, I'm Prill? Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Still standing? Um, yeah. <laughs> you can contact me. If you want to send me an email, email me at WFUV, and the email address is Darren DeVivo, which is D A R R E N D E V I V O at WFUV.org. Or uh, go to Facebook. I have two pages, and many folks have been happy to see are reaching out to me. It would be easier if you just simply went to the radio page that has their longer name, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Because what I tend to do is ask the people who friend me on my personal page, Darren DeVivo, to, you know, go over to the other page. And I'm sure I've offended some folks thinking he doesn't want to be my friend, which isn't the case. So uh, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio is a Facebook page that uh, you should go to and we'll be in contact then. And I'm always posting stuff about Beatles and other music in general, of course, being that I work at WFUV. Uh, there's a lots of other things going on. Uh, and I like to share news bits and kind of occasionally my opinion about things. And of course, some sports pops up here and there. So that's the Facebook page, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Ken? Well, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can reach me there. Uh, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I do want to mention a couple of things about the website because I just did a really nice interview with Ken McNabb, who happened to be a great guest on this show. Uh, Ken, you might know for a couple of books he's written, The Beatles in Scotland, and more recently, one called End in the End, The Last Days of the Beatles. And uh, I did an hour-long interview with him all about 1969, all the events that happened with the Beatles, group solo, the business differences that they had, their personal lives. We covered a lot of topics in one hour, and you can find that on my website, as well as my Beatles trivia page, uh, in which you can win one of nine prizes every single week. And I have a new prize to add to those nine prizes. It's uh, something that I mentioned in... Our Beatles news segment, Peter Asher, who has a brand new book out. It's called The Beatles from A to Z. You can win a copy of that book uh, just by entering my Beatles trivia contest, which runs every week from Monday through Sunday. There's always a winner every single week. And uh, I give away CDs, DVDs, books, you name it. Everything from A to Z on The Beatles. <laughs> See how I work that in? Mm. <laughs> so, again, that's at uh, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget my other Beatles podcast show. It's called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. It's on every other Monday night live on Facebook on that page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can join me with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and at the moment, Mean Mr. Mustard. Uh, who is subbing for Ken Womack until uh, he rejoins us, hopefully, in January. And um, most of what we talk about is the solo Beatles. It's a live show. If you join us, you can add your own comments as the show is going out live. And then it remains on YouTube and our Facebook page. And you can also pick up the audio on Podbean and YouTube, just like this show. I really enjoy doing all these shows, uh, including Every Little Thing, my syndicated Beatles radio program. I won't get into that. I've talked enough. Enough <laughs> yakking, okay. as Rob Ryder would say. Mm -hmm. So, back to you, Alan. Okay, well, so, for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.